Thank you so much, Jacina, for this very, very kind introduction. Um, yeah, hopefully um, I do not disappoint <laughs> now the expectations. Um, oh, sorry. I want to share now my screen because I brought you a PowerPoint. Um, sorry, now my phone is. As Shakina mentioned, I will talk to you now about my project uh, on the on multi literacy and the interrelation between language ability and first and second language and extra linguistic factors. And I will start with some. Oh, why doesn't it work? Sorry. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um. No. Okay, this is the structure of my talk. Okay, this is some starting problems here <laughs> uh, to get in. Um, first, I will talk to you about um, multilingualism and literacy in general. So I will introduce you in this topic. Then I will mention my pilot study. And this was uh, one of the articles I gave to you. This was the um, article of in 2013. Um, I just I, I suppose that you have read this, so I just want to mention um, a few things about that. And then I will talk about the project multiliteracy. Uh, first, um, I will um, talk about the multi mutual influence of text competence in L1 and L2, and this means heritage language and dominant language. Uh, then I will talk about the impact of the extra -ling fa linguistic factors and finally about the impact of language awareness. This is something I, uh, um, I, I um, analyzed only recently and this is also a very interesting topic and then I will come to the conclusions. Okay. Um, so I always started from, from this point as said, as speakers who grow up with two or more languages simultaneously, so what we call simultaneous bilinguals, and acquire the writing abilities only in one language, and this normally is the dominant language, you know, in the migration context, they remind monolingual in the domain of writing. So we have a lot of um, observations, um, I, I suppose also in the Canadian context, or, but also in the German context, we have a lot of um, children with a migrant background and heritage language speakers who have not the possibility to acquire literacy in their heritage language and then they are not able for instance, to write uh, an official letter or something. So they have not the, uh, uh, the possibilities to get jobs where they can use the heritage language, for instance. Um, and also in the in research and studies on heritage language, uh, writing was identified as the weakest language ability. I mean, speaking, is okay, of course, also hearing and also reading uh, sometimes um, was possible, but writing is something that is very, uh, and also um, uh, a competence that needs a lot of um, different yeah, sub competence and capacities. Um, speakers, um, and, and as a consequence, uh, speakers can only partially profit from the opportunities offered by what we call natural multilingualism. And um, there are also other researchers uh, or many researchers also um, claim that migrant children also must develop their knowledge of the L1 of the heritage language in order to become so-called true bilinguals. Okay, we can <laughs> discuss it later. But it's also important to maintain their cultural identity. And this is another aspect, I mean, apart from the chop thing I, I mentioned, it, in, in my eyes, this is an even more important factor. 
Okay, so on the one hand, we see if um, uh, heritage speakers do not acquire um, writing abilities in the heritage language, they have some shortcomings because they cannot achieve um, the same level of uh, language competence um, as in the um, national language. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of studies who show that there are lifelong benefits in becoming bilingual and biliteral. I will also mention the um, studies by um, Ellen Bialysok, who did a lot um, of research on this aspect, and you probably all know her. Um, she um, found a lot of cognitive advantages and also increased language awareness in children who acquired also um, literacy in the heritage language. So they, or they, they became biliterate also in early years. Um, and there are also um, studies uh, and, uh, um, and, and um, theories who uh, demonstrate or maintain that the first language literacy is related also to literacy development in the second language. We have a lot of um, projects who also could um, show that there is some interdependence, uh, but um, I will come to one point uh, afterwards. It's not sure what comes first. <laughs> Please keep that in mind. Um, and we have, we've, we have also studies um, that show that early bilingual literacy also fosters literacy in the third language. Yeah? So if you uh, acquire literacy in two languages in the in early years, then you also have an advantage when you uh, acquire the third language or fourth language or whatsoever. Okay, and now I come to something and I <laughs> spoke to Jacquina before I was not sure because uh, whether I bore you when I mentioned that because um, there is a very, very well known hypothesis and I think all of you have heard of all of you have, have, have sorry, all of you have heard of this. This is the linguistic interdependence hypothesis um, that was um, and that that goes back to Jim Cummins, uh, actually already in 1978, and in later publication he he also um, kind of re, re, repeated or revised uh, this um, hypothesis. Not not revised, but he kind of um, always maintained this that um, the certain L1 knowledge can be positively transferred during the process of L2 acquisition. This was, this is part of this hypothesis. And um, that means that the L1 linguistic knowledge and skills that a child possesses can be extremely instrumental to the development of corresponding abilities in the second language. And probably you have you have heard also of this threshold hypothesis, yeah? and I will come to that in a minute. Uh, that Cummins maintains that you have to achieve a certain threshold, especially in this what he calls um, cognitive academic linguistic proficiency, so academic language, what we call, uh, to um, be able to, to um, reach also a high level of academic language proficiency in the second language. Uh, th there's a lot of discussion on this and um, also criticism, um, but I just wanted to mention this. And um, there's also um, the so-called coming underlying proficiency model um, where, um, 
um, Cummings said that as children acquire academic knowledge and skills in their first language, they also acquire language independent information about those skills that can be applied when learning a second language. There is some information that is language independent. Yeah? And um, he then introduced, probably you all know this, the so-called so -called dual iceberg model of bilingual proficiency. He says there are some, the surface features of one language, yeah, on, on the one hand uh, of the first language, surface features of second language. Okay, the, this is what you see <laughs> of the iceberg. And then there's a lot of um, material that is under the surface of the of the water, below the water, and this is what he calls common, common, common underlying proficiency. And yeah, what is coming common underlying proficiency? And this is actually what has been criticized with Cummins because he, he first he could not say where is this threshold and what exactly is common underlying proficiency, but there is probably something. And that's exactly what we want to find out, what we wanted to find out, and also other researchers uh, before me wanted to find out, but it's not so easy, I tell you. <laughs> and um, so, especially my uh, Swiss colleagues, Bertele and Lambert, they um, did an interesting project on the um, writing abilities of Portuguese heritage speaking children, heritage language speaking children in, uh, in Switzerland. And um, they maintain that the interdependence is not defined by thresholds that there's a threshold and if you pass the threshold, then you have the proficiency, but it's rather continuous in nature. And I think uh, th this is also in line with the multi-competence approach. And I hope everybody of you have heard of this. Um, this is um, the approach that's, which starts from the assumption that by and multilinguals make use of a holistic multilingual repertoire in which the influence among language systems is not only reciprocal between L1 and L2 and L3, so they influence each other, but, and this is very important, it also results in changes in the complete system. And this is also what, what I always told my students. Uh, so this is something like my credo or whatsoever you call it. You say, never compare a bilingual or multilingual person with mo a monolingual person. Yeah, because uh, a bilingual person languages differently as Ophelia Garcia said. And this is actually uh, the case in this multi-competence approach. And I think this goes in hand in hand with the idea that this there is an interdependence, but I mean, it can always, you know, um, change accordingly to when you, for instance, if you act literally in one language with more frequency, the system changes in the far as these patterns become part of the shared linguistic repertoire. So it might happen that sometimes you take um, some patterns you have learned in one language and you transfer to the second language and uh, sometimes you transfer uh, patterns from the second language to the other and it's always in a flux. And I think this is uh, an important thing, so, uh, um, important thing so we should not, um, speak about the threshold and then that's it. But we have to keep in mind that there is always a mutual influence in both directions. And also a completely different thing that the whole system changes. Okay, yeah, having this in mind, I always, I actually, I was 
always eager to find out whether I could prove that there is some interdependence of uh, uh, writing abilities in the heritage language in the dominant language. And the first thing what I did was that I conducted a pilot study uh, in Cologne, uh, where I was first based before I came to Munich. And this was actually what I did with my students. I said to my students, okay, uh, we have the seminar and everybody, so we have several groups and you go to different schools and then you ask students to write texts. Okay, at this time, at that time, in 2008, it was still possible. There were not so many permissions necessary and all, all these kind of things. And we also had some corporations, the University of Cologne had cooperation with schools. So this was possible at that time. And then my students went to the schools and they, of course, spoke to the teachers and said, can we um, take text? And they took an, a narrative and an expository or argumentative text uh, with bilingual, no, yeah, with bilingual and monolingual um, students. So actually uh, what they did, they went into the class and they said, okay, please write a text in German. That was in the, in the, the school language. And so, and those students who were bilingual were asked to write uh, another text or another two texts in their heritage language. And then we collected. There were different school types. Okay, I'm not going into detail about that because the German school system is very, very complicated. So we have different kinds of secondary schools. Uh, and for instance, what is gymnasium, this is a um, university preparatory school, and then we have this Hauptschule, this is for more lower level, so it's only, it ends with the ninth grade, and, and then we have uh, also what, what this kind of Realschule, this is kind of vocational school. Okay, um, you, you can imagine that we have had a lot of a, a variety of different languages. But um, what I then did, I actually analyzed the largest group and they, these were the Turkish students, the Russians and the Italians, uh, Italian heritage speakers. And um, I have to say, we also collected some additional data. So uh, social linguistic questionnaire on social data, language use, language content, language attitudes and so on. Okay. This um, is what I published in this article then in, in 2013. And um, I have to say, and you have probably noticed, this was just a qualitative study. So I wanted just to, to look at different types of text and writing. And also I experienced a little bit with um, the, the mode, how I could, um, analyze best these texts yeah, about we, I, I had to develop an analytic grid and and everything to analyze this text it's not not so easy and um so what i um found out in this pilot study was that um if students had a low competence in the heritage language, uh, they normally transfer patterns from the oral discourse in their written texts. So they actually you know, had, had, had not acquired the, this repertoire they need when they write a text. I, I come to that in a minute. And um, if they have a higher competence, they also transfer patterns from the second language, from the school language. And this is the discourse mode. Um, this is the way um, to express oneself in a written register. I would say the type of register. Uh, ex I will explain this later because I have a slide with this um, framework. And of course, they can also transfer the macrostructure of the texts, what they have acquired 
in the school language to the first language. Um, this especially holds for the argumentative text and the students had no formal instruction in this text type in L1. So now I have to tell you something about heritage language instruction in Germany, though this is actually quite poor. So most students only have the possibility to um, have heritage language instruction in after school programs. Um, some also have Saturday schools, but most of them have only after school pro, uh, programs, and this is only two hours a week, and it's mostly on Friday afternoon, and imagine Friday afternoon, everybody goes football playing or whatsoever, and you have to go to school in the heritage language class. Yeah. And um, and the other problem, and I will come to that also at the end of my talk again, is that um, we have, the, in most cases, heritage language teachers had no teacher training in Germany. So they only have the teacher training in the home countries. And sometimes, you, as you can imagine, the methods of teaching are completely different. Uh, and sometimes they have this kind of, I don't know, kind of frontal uh, teaching and the teacher standing in front of the class. And so we in Germany and probably in Canada, same, we have the interactional teaching. And so students normally are used to this. And so a lot of students find heritage language classes rather boring. And this is also a problem uh, with, with the system, I think. Um, high competence in the heritage language is reflected in the narrative text and narrative texts were much easier to write. Uh, okay, this is normal eh? because uh, a narrative texts are easier to conceptualize. They are also um, learned very early in life. So they belong to everyday language and things like that. Okay. Um, the final results, and you probably also have read uh, them in, in the article, uh, are that there is evidence that the text production abilities in both languages are interdependent, especially when the students have reached a certain underlying proficiency in one of the language. I will not say in uh, the first language, can also be in the second language. Um, whether specific features can be transferred from one language to the other is, however, dependent on a variety of extra linguistic factors. And um, we will see this also in the second study. Um, instruction in the heritage language has an impact on written discourse competence, but not, is not a sufficient condition. And what I already found out in this pilot study was that the students who um, were exposed, who exposed high competency in, in the heritage language text production had either been additionally instructed by their parents, some of them actually got additional lesson by the parents, or they practiced literacy activities outside the classroom. Probably they, they read books or something like that. Okay, keep that in mind, because then <laughs> now I come to the, the final study, uh, because I found this so interesting. And then I, I, I thought I have to go deeper into that. And I have, of course, uh, I have to do a study that is more systematic. Uh, this and this was a pilot thing and qualitative study. Um, then I applied for some grants and then I got some grants to get this um, final project, what we call in German Mehrschriftlichkeit, uh, multiliteracy in English. And um, and this um, and in this project in, at the beginning, um, we wanted to include. 300 subjects, but it was extremely difficult to find enough subjects to recruit the subjects for this project. And I tell you why, uh, because I mean, 
the, the language groups are completely spread all over Munich. This was the project um, actually uh, uh, I conducted in Munich. They were spread all over the city. And there were many schools who did not volunteer to, uh, to take part in the, in the study because they said, oh, we have already so many projects and so, and it was very, very difficult to recruit students for, for this project. And so at the end, we turned out with, with 206, but I think it was enough. And we included three different family languages. Okay, here I mentioned, I, I've used the, the term family language uh, normally I say heritage language, I mean, um, we can discuss this later, what we want to, <laughs> to use, but you know what I mean. And um, this was Turkish and it was Italian and it was Greek. And I tell you why, as you can see here in this graph, um, the Turkish population is, is the biggest um, population, um, migrant population in Germany um, um, in general and in Munich in particular. And there are uh, uh, 38,000 in Munich. Munich has about 1 million, uh, 1.5 million inhabitants in the whole. Um, Italians also uh, form quite a large group, um, a little bit smaller. Uh, the specialty of the, of the Italians is that um, they have a, a long history in, in Munich um, because uh, already in the 70th century, there were a lot of artists and um, uh, um, musicians and uh, architects uh, in Munich at the, uh, at the court. And, um, and already in the 19th century, there arrived a lot of um, foreign workers from, from Italy. And I tell you why, probably you, in, when you are in Canada, you cannot imagine, but it takes you only two and a half hours in car to arrive at the Italian border two and a half hours by car to arrive at the Italian border. So you can, you can okay, then you are still in the Alps, yeah? not, not in Flor Florence or somewhere, somewhere, but it's it's so close, yeah? And so uh, some, some people also say, Munich is the northernmost city of Italy, yeah? Because it has some Italian flair and stuff. Okay, and that is also why the Italian, Italian speakers have quite a, a high prestige also in the Munich uh, in the population in the um, uh, majority um, and the Greek are also a special group because uh, they are the biggest um, Greek there is the biggest Greek community in uh, in in Munich, the biggest Greek community of Germany in Munich. And they also maintain their own school system. They have a, two primary schools and one secondary school that is um, financed by the Greek state. So this is also a special specialty. So that were the reasons why we took these three groups. Um, all of them had a German, German as an early second language um, and they all, all were in the ninth and tenth grade. Okay, um, now our, oh, sorry, um, the instruments, um, actually I, more or less repeated the pilot studies. So I, we also had narrative and argumentative texts in both languages. Here you see uh, the, for the narrative texts, we had a um, picture impulse um, that you see at the, here at the, at the right side, you see this uh, picture with a fireball coming in the courtyard into pistons here. Uh, this was um, for the story in German and the impulse for the story in the heritage language was a kind of time travel between Munich in 2014 into 2017, 1908 or something. And for the uh, argumentative text, um, 
students were asked to, to write a letter to the principal, to the principal of the school. And in, the, um, in German, it was um, that we maintained that the principal was going to um, ban the mobile phones out of the school area. And the second was that um, foreign languages were banned from the schoolyard. Uh, so they should not be spoken in the schoolyard. Uh, we also took social linguistic interviews in both languages, a language awareness test in both languages, and parental interviews. Our research questions were, um, among others, in what way do writing abilities of bilingual adolescents in L1 and L2 correlate? Are differences in writing abilities shown as specific? Are there differences between different heritage language communities, between the different heritage language communities? Um, how do extra linguistic factors influence writing abilities in both languages? And is there an impact of language awareness on textual competences? Um, I quickly show you the steps of our analysis. So first, we dig digitalize the text and um, uh, build up a text corpus in an SQL database. Then we transcribed the interviews and, and extracted language use profiles. Um, then we analyzed the text um, with an analytical grid. Um, I will come to that in a minute. We also scored the language awareness test, and then we had quantitative and qualitative analysis. Um, and for the text um, analysis, we had three independent raters. Okay, how did we define the text level? I, I, I gave you my text, uh, and hopefully you have read this um, article where I spoke about um, the textual analysis because I, I did not want to analyze, you know, only say words and or um, text length or something like that. But I, wa I wanted to have a more global approach to text structure. So um, I considered the macrostructure, the discourse mode and the discourse stance. And so um, at the end, uh, we turned out with five different levels. Uh, when you remember that um, the article, the, in the article, um, we had only three levels, but at the end, uh, we saw that it's more fine, fine grained when we have five levels. So, how did we define the levels? So, you see here this microsecond discourse mode. Um, I will come. Okay, the macro structure is one thing. So we have different linear or more um, um, material oriented or, or really the typical pro contra conclusive structure, something like that. But now let me talk about discourse mode because this is um, something um, that ha two, two of my German um, colleagues that was Koch and Österreicher um, have defined, and this is this conceptual orality and conceptual literacy, what they, they call this. So there are different levels between a mode that is, you know, like spoken language, this is conceptual oral. So it's written, but I mean, it's like when I speak. So for instance, how you how you uh, write uh, WhatsApp? Yeah? This is more spoken language. What you use in a WhatsApp, uh, and when you write a letter to to, to a professor, whatsoever, then you write or or, or an academic text, and this really on this conceptual written pole. So there, there is um, a continuum, and so I wanted to show. Um, some um, criteria that um, influence our um, analytical grids. So when um, students and at the lexical level, so students used basic or colloquial vocabularies, they had a low type token ratio, so use past perturbers. Um, I only learned um, a, a, a few months ago that in English you don't say past perturbers. These are, are catch-all terms. 
Yeah, so like thing or make or what, what you can use for episode. So um, uh, on the other side, um, you have elaborated academic vocabulary, you have high to type token ratio and so on. And the more syntactic level, you have so-called aggregative patterns. So you, you have very short sentences, one sh sentence after the other, uh, elliptic construction, agent oriented structures. And on the other hand, you have on the other side, you have this integrative uh, pattern. So you have nominalizations, you have a lot of uh, subordination and things like that. And the same is holds for the text organization level. Um, here we decide, um, here we differentiate between uh, basic particles uh, of linear organization and elaborated text organizer and things like that. Just to give you an idea, I will give you some examples later where you can actually see how this look like, looks like. So at the end, we have these five levels. So level one is the lowest, where we have very linear um, macrostructure, a conceptual oral discourse mode. And, uh, and the other thing is the uh, involvement. So mostly, uh, very self-referent. So in argumentative text, normally you have to write in a more objective um, way, so in a more detached way. But um, so if people say, I find, I think, and so things like that. So this is level one and level five. Finally, um, this is a pattern oriented structure. It is um, conceptual written and you have this detachment and the other levels are in between. Um, don't worry about that. I, I show you later some example, then <laughs> it becomes, I think, um, clearer. Um, okay, um, now I show you some um, results for, of the quantitative analysis, and um, I concentrate. Um, no, um, yeah, sorry. Um, later, I concentrate on the argumentative text, but um, the, on the quantitative analysis, we, we had an analysis on first on the different text levels between heritage language and German, and there were significant differences. So the text level scores in the heritage language were significantly lower than in the school language German. And also um, the text levels in between the genres all together in the argumentative and the narrative text differ significantly. Here I have some box plots where you can this is the these so these are the um, total scores for the first language um, in uh, and you see the median is here between four and four four and six and in the second language the median is higher and you also have um, broader interquartile range and here you see the box plots for the text genres you see also here in the narrative text that the median is higher and in the argumentative text is lower and uh, you also have a wider range here as well. Um, we also looked at um, the, the, the text level um, scores across language group and language, and uh, here it um, turned out, out that the distinctions um, were most prominent in the Greek speakers as compared to the Turkish and Italian subjects, but uh, this distinction was not significant. But as you can see from this um, table, and uh, you see that there is also, these are the means, you know, remember we have had the levels one to five, and these are the mean levels, and you also can see a very um, 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 yeah, here, uh, here, here is the um, standard deviation. And in, in brackets, you have the standard uh, uh, deviation is also quite um, large, and especially um, in the Greek group here. Yeah, the, in the, the Greek group, you see here, uh, mainly in the second language, that they have 
the higher uh, scores, uh, higher means than the um, Turkish and Italian students. And uh, this holds for the argumentative text and also for the narrative text. And I show you this now in a more detailed um, graph. Um, here you, you can see the scores um, that um, the students reach in the different languages. You have blue are the Turkish speakers, green are the Italian speakers, and this, how do you call it, ikru or whatsoever, this something or beige, um, the, the Greek speakers. Yeah? And interestingly, this only holds for the argumentative text, none of the subtexts produced the highest level in the heritage language. Um, only level four. Um, only 18% of the Turkish and of the Italians reached three and four. And um, the students with Greek as L1 reached higher scores, 35%, as you see, um, for three and four. Remember, uh, three and four are the levels where you already have this um, conceptual written um, register. So um, where you can see that they have acquired some of this academic written register you need to write an argumentative text. Um, now we come to L2 and here we see that students with Italian and Turkish as L1 write predominantly in a conceptual oral mode, also in, in, the, in German, in the second language. Uh, 58% um, and 60%. Uh, and also here, the Greek students, 37% of the Greek students achieve text levels four and five, also higher levels um, in uh, here. As you, the Greek are these beige ones. Eh? So now we also, uh, had a correlation of textual competence. Um, so we conducted the patient correlation um, test and we, we, the, we found out that the text level scores in both languages are highly correlated. And there is really a high correlation, um, um, 0 0.56 and 57. Uh, and both correlations also were highly significant, um, as you can see here in this heat map. And of course, then I, I concluded, <laughs> ah, yeah, there is a high correlation uh, between uh, the first and the, and, the, and the second language. That means students who have a high competence in the first language also have a high competence in the second language. Yeah, but I was not satisfied with this assumption, but I also uh, made a qualitative analysis. I actually uh, compare text production of individual subjects across the languages and um, wanted to find out whether uh, students with high competence uh, in, in L1 also achieve high scores in L2. And yes, this was, uh, that turned out that it was true. All subjects who reached level four in the argumentative text in L1, remember, um, there, were no, there was no level five in the, in the heritage language, produced argumentative text in L2 at the same level or even at the highest level, that is five. We, we only had one exception and um, this could, uh, could be explained by um, um, socio-biographic data, but it was still level three um, the students reached. Okay, um, now um, um, let me talk about the influence of the extra linguistic factors. This was also something we were interested in. Um, so um, we had a regression analysis um, and the dependent vari variable was the text competence scores and predictor variables instruction in the heritage language, reading activities in both language and writing activities in both languages. 
And here are our results. First, uh, the effect of heritage language instruction, instruction. It turned out that heritage language instruction had a positive effect when it lasted longer than six years. And this effect was even higher for, uh, language, for the second language and was significant. You see here um, the, the blue, um, blue is L1 and um, red is L2. Yeah? So you can see, see the effect L2 is even a little bit higher than for um, L1. There was, and this is really interesting um, finding, there was a positive impact in L1 and L2 when students, students attended a schooling program in the mother tongue in primary years. And the, these were, and, and interestingly, the impact was equally high in both languages and was, oh, sorry, mama mia, <laughs> what did I do? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so talking about technical uh, catastrophes, yeah. <laughs> um, now I come to the um, effect of reading in L1 and L2. Um, here it turned out that reading more than six books a year had a significant impact on text competence in L1 and also positive but not significant uh, effect on L2. You can see here, um, and reading more than six books a year in German has a slightly positive impact on L2, but no impact on L1. This is for reading. Okay, you say that this seems um, plausible, but now let's look. Uh, let's have a look on writing, and this is really interesting because. It turned out that writing and writing more complex texts like diaries, stories, and essays in L1 has a significant influence on text competences in, in the heritage language and was significant, and also a positive influence on writing abilities in L2. Um, but, um, and writing, of complex text in L2, in the second language, that is German, has a significant impact on text competences in both languages. Okay. And this is really um, a hint or a cue that is there is also transfer from the, the second language to the first language. Okay. Um, let me quickly discuss these um, findings of the extralinguistic factors. Um, the, why did a heritage language instruction um, have no impact when it lasted less than six years? I think that has something to do uh, with what I have mentioned before, that the heritage language classes are in the afternoon program and they also um, and the teachers are not qualified and things like that so it's really dependent on design and quality of the program uh, in contrast we have seen that the schooling in the heritage language has a significant positive impact on writing abilities in both languages and reading of books and writing of more complex text types like SS diaries, are decisive factors influencing text competence. And um, yeah, I want to mention we also had the writing in social media and something has had much lower impact. Yeah, why? As I mentioned before, when you write a WhatsApp or whatsoever, you can use colloquial language, so you don't have to use these written registers. Okay, now I come to two case studies and finally to some texts. <laughs> um, the, uh, I have um, taken some text from the Italian group because I think probably some of you know some Italian. Greek is a little bit difficult because it's written with other uh, characters and things like that. So 
Um, we have Mario. Mario is attending the gymnasium. The parents are from Italy. Um, he grew up with German um, and Italian um, simultaneously. Uh, had five years of heritage language classes. The family language is German. It's predominant German. And he reads in Italian on very rare occasions and also um, writes Italian on rare occasions. Whereas Vittorio, who attends the ninth grade, um, also both parents from Italy, um, took up German in the kindergarten and had nine years of heritage language instruction. Family language is Italian, and he reads in Italian journals and also in Italian lessons and writes in Italian in social media. Uh, let's have a look at the, at Mario. That was the first one uh, and his argumentative text. Um, if someone knows German, he can read, he or she can read this, the, the left column. I read only the Right column. Dear principal, I have heard of the ban of mobile phones at our school and would like to present my opinion. On the one hand, I find this ban bad because it's not necessary to introduce a mobile phone ban during the break. On the other hand, I find such a ban good as it separates our mobile addicted use from this instrument. I would rather be against this ban as one can also use a mobile phone to copy exercise book entries and book pages. So one need no, no, not to carry all the books and exercise books home anymore. Kind of guys. Okay, so you see, uh, this was a rough translation. So we actually rated this text, uh, text level two. Why? Because um, it's, um, it, it, it contains, a, is a um, very basic vocabulary, uh, often repeating all the same thing, not necessary, bad, find, exercise book, and so on, and so on. Um, and there's also um, a lot of involvement of the um, uh, writer. Uh, I have heard, I, I, um, I find, I find, I would rather and think like that. And um, moreover, there is not, not, not a lot of syntactic, integ syntactic integrations. And you also have one argument one, on the one hand, on the other hand, two arguments and no proper macro syntactic structure. Um, in Italian, um, Mario writes the following text, there is no um, address or something, he just writes, for my account, the ban to speak foreign language during school break is bad because every student must have the possibility to speak a foreign language, though they learn this language is best because speaking a language is the best training for this language. And if you forbid to speak foreign languages, you see, always he repeats to speak and um, the best and speak or not true and things like that. And um, there is no proper macro syntactic structure. Uh, there's a lot of, there's also, <clears throat> yeah, not so much involvement, but it's a for my account. And it's a very simple text, I would say, always repeating the same uh, phrases. And this is a text at level one. Okay, this was Mario. Now let's have a look at Vittorio. Um, I'm not going to read now this whole text, uh, but Vittorio, as you see, it's much <laughs> a larger text. A dear Prince, I'm writing to you to express my opinion on the issue of ban on mobiles. Yeah, you see, there's a proper introduction. And then he, um, he introduces his arguments. First, students' connection become weaker. Consequently, students make friends less frequently. Furthermore, uh, and at the end, the most important point, however, is the destruction. And you also see that he uses a quite um, elaborated vocabulary, like destruction and things like that. Due to permanent use of mobile phones and little contribution in class, there will be big gaps in knowledge. <laughs> 
and um, so um, and at the end, also he said, I hope that due to my argumentation, so the, this is what we would call a classical pro contra argumentation, um, and we also have a high level of um, academic language register, though so this is actually um, text level five. And then um, the text of the same student in Italian. And um, this is also a quite high level uh, of text, but you say, you see what I have marked here in violet or whatsoever to say child children. There's some repetition of uh, vocabulary and also some um, little bit more basic vocabulary. And um, it's not uh, so elaborated as the text in, in, in German. And he also copies, and this is very interesting, he copies the same um, text stru structural um, patterns, first another point and, and so on from the second language. So this at the end, it, it uh, came out as text level four, um, because he also had a little bit of involvement, like, you know, I would like, and I, um, I would like to add and things like that. Um, if, if you're interested, I, I, I can back to that later in the discussion. So what we have seen is that subjects who have no or only little access to L1 literacy have problems in text structuring and they transfer the patterns from the oral discourse as we have seen. So it's more like, you know, spoken language. And subjects with access to literacy in L1 um, transfer the macrostructural patterns from L2. This is, was also an interesting um, uh, finding so that he actually really come primo punto, come altro punto. Uh, normally you would not use this kind of um, structural elements in, in Italian. This is really uh, copied from, from German here. Um, so the explanation, okay, goes without saying the macrosexual patterns are acquired in the school language. There is no formal instruction in the argumentative text in L1 and the patterns are transferred from German into the heritage language text. Okay, now I have seen that I have already spoken 55 minutes, I think. I have. <laughs> so I, 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 I skip now my observations on um, language awareness. I just give you um, a few um, impressions of that, but I, I, I want to not to go into detail. We had a language awareness test. If you're interested, I can show that to you um, uh, also later in the discussion. Um, but no, let me go ahead. So um, what I would like to mention is that there was also a very high correlation in the language awareness. Uh, sorry, I have to move this here. Yeah, um, there was a high correlation of the scores the students obtained in the language awareness test and the text level scores. And you can see here, you have um, a high co um, correlation coefficient. This is uh, 0.42 and highly significant uh, in L2. Um, and in, in, in the narrative text and even higher coefficient in the um, in the argumentative text and even again high even slightly higher coefficients in the in L, L1 in the narrative and then the argumentative text and um, here I can uh, also show you the scores across the language group and what you can see here again uh, the the middle group are the Greeks and the Greek also score higher both in this, this is L1 and in L2 in the language awareness test as well. Yeah, you can see it that they have the higher median and also here a lower interquartile range. 
Yeah. Um, I skipped something, but <laughs> I tell you what I what what you missed. Uh, the meta linguistic awareness and textual competence are correlated. Um, and the better performances in the Greek group can be explained by the following. There are some unusual features of the Greek migration to Germany. We have commuting migration and transnational mobility, um, higher um, commuting migration than in the other groups. And the Greek working migrants are interested in uh, accumulating uh, educational qualifications and are oriented to uh, towards returning home and especially holds for the second generation. So they have this, and, and this is also reflected in higher academic attainments of Greek students, um, what also turned out in other studies. And of course, they have the available, uh, this Greek school system that is available. Okay, I come to my general conclusions. Uh, we have seen that writing abilities in L1 and L2 are highly correlated. The competences in L1 can be transferred to L2 and vice versa. Reading and writing in heritage language turned out the most vital factor influencing text competence, both in L1 and L2. There are high correlations between language awareness and textual competence. And um, last but not least, um, L1 instruction has no negative impact on the development of writing abilities in L2. So our findings adds to the literature advocating for the benefits of heritage language education and also supports the necessity to develop a curriculum to support bilingualism and biliteracy. So thanks to my team. And thank you for listening to me for such a long time. I'm always, I don't know, I, <laughs> I'm always running out of time. So thank you so much. <laughs>